Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody for joining us today, as well as for folks who are joining us uh, online. My name is Richard Nephew, and I am a senior research scholar and uh, program director for economic statecraft, sanctions, and energy markets at the Center of Global Energy Policy here at Columbia University. This morning, we are going to talk about Japan's nuclear outlook with two distinguished experts and guests, and I will introduce them in just a moment. Let me first say that this event, like any event at the Center, is being webcast live, and both the video and podcast recording will be available on our website and on iTunes in the coming days. And for those of you watching online, as well as people here in the audience, you can ask a question for the panelists at any time using the hashtag CGEP events, C-G-E-P events, and our Twitter handle, at Columbia U Energy, and my personal Twitter handle, at our nephew C-G-E-P. Our discussion today will begin with a presentation by Nobuo Tanaka, who is a non-resident fellow here at the Center on Global Energy Policy. Mr. Tanaka is also president of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation in Tokyo, Japan. Mr. Tanaka's experience with energy and finance began when he joined the Japanese Ministry of Economic uh, Trade and Industry in 1973. While in the Japanese government service, he also served at the Japanese Embassy in Washington, D.C., and at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. His last post was as executive director at the International Energy Agency from 2007 to 2011. Mr. Tanaka has a degree in economics from the University of Tokyo and an MBA from Case Western Reserve University. After Mr. Tanaka's presentation, we will have a discussion between him, me, and our second distinguished guest, Chris Gadomsky, who is the head of nuclear research for Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Mr. Gadomsky is also an adjunct professor at NYU School of Gra Continuing and Professional Studies, where he's taught graduate courses in energy policy since 2005. Prior to joining Bloomberg New Energy Finance, Mr. Gadomsky was a business development consultant providing expertise and advice to multilateral firms and institutions, including the UN Development Program, World Bank, and U.S. Department of Energy. Mr. Gadomsky has a degree in economics from College of the Holy Cross, as well as an MBA from the uh, City of University of New York. Gentlemen, thank you for coming today and for offering us your thoughts. Mr. Tanaka, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, uh, for, for providing me the opportunity to talk to, to you today. Um, I am uh, the currently the president of the Sasagawa Peace Foundation and uh, used to be the head of the International Energy Agency in Paris. So my presentation is uh, uh, today uh, is what is a global context when where we discuss about the nuclear in Japan um, and and tell the idea of the sustainable nuclear power. I mean, I mean uh, the, not only the CO2 emission reduction, but how could we uh, make a possible technology who, which we can uh, use uh, to solve the problem which we face in Japan. IEA always show the world energy outlook, and this is the one which in the November last year, the newest version. And the most important message of the uh, new wild energy outlook is this low oil price. Everybody knows the current price of oil is about a third from 2014. It may prolong, as uh, Ye says, to our 2020s even. So if that the situation continues, uh, what's, what would be the consequence? Uh, one big feature of this low price of oil is shale oil. Shale oil is now the balancer in the market. When the price is high, it comes up. When the price is low, it will reduce the production. So it's a built-in stabilizer, the function of the market, and it deprives that kind of function from OPEC in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is testing how resilient the shale is. So this is a big uh, change of the structure of the uh, uh, oil market as well as gas market. Future of the investment is declining, so this will certainly create problem for the future capacity of the oil because uh, high cost prices like uh, North America or South America, or Russia, they will not invest. Only investment may happen in the Middle East, which is shaky. So the risk is that we need to depend more and more on to the Middle East in the future. This is a scenario which I said some time ago, but uh, half of the Middle East is from Iraq. So can it really happen like this? The 
price, low price of oil means less revenue for the Middle East, and that means they cannot pay for the social stability. So less oil from the other part of the world means that we have to depend more and more onto the Middle Eastern oil, which is less and less stable geopolitically. So this is the biggest risk of the low oil price situation. Um, America, United States is very different from other uh, countries. This is a chart of uh, uh, oil uh, dependency, import dependency, and gas import dependency. So the traditional importers on the right-hand side, uh, traditional exporters on left and down side, US is in the middle. And uh, this is a so-called energy depend independence of the United States is happening in terms of gas, in terms of oil. So U.S. is very strong in terms of the geopolitical power in a global context and energy market. And U.S. is kind of sole winner in, the, in this game. But I'm very much concerned of the current presidential election. The U.S. Uh, movement is to the isolationism. Even the best player, the sole winner is going to be the, uh, let's say, uh, 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 try to be independent uh, and isolation is really dangerous in the global sense. This is not a subject today, but maybe of interest to you. Um, U.S. do not no longer need to depend on the Middle East from oil. How can U.S. protect the fr free navigation of the Strait of Hormuz? It's a role of Japan, India, China, more in the future. Um, China is preparing for one belt, one road by pipelines, et cetera, in soliciting its energy <coughs> independence of itself. But it's, uh, it triggers the concern of the neighboring country as well as U U.S. Department of Defense. Um, China's, I, I will not pass, I will pass. This is a U.S. situation. U.S. is, thanks to the very cheap gas, it replaces coal. And with renewables, United States CO2 emission has been reduced and energy uh, import, so GDP grows. So this is a triple win for the U.S. Energy security is more collective nature. This shows that many countries have a different portfolio, but Europe as a whole is connected to each other by grid, and it's a collective energy security. This is a chart. Germany can phase out nuclear because it's in the middle of the Europe importing necessary electricity from France or Poland or Czech. So this uh, uh, geopolitical advantage gives a pri uh, the liberty of phasing out nuclear in Germany, but Japan cannot because it's not connected to anybody, even within uh, 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 the country. This is the ASEAN situation. Some guy like Masayoshi Son proposed Asian super grid. Um, yeah, this is visionary, but certainly the Asian future is the collective energy security maybe, just as Europe is doing. Yes, Japanese situation is a problem. Tokyo Electric lost all the nuclear here after Fukushima accident. But uh, Western part has a huge overcapacity, spare capacity, but it cannot be transmitted to the east because connectivity is so low. There are two frequency zones in Japan. IEA has been warning Japanese government, if it's not rectified, you will have problem. And it happened in March 11, 2011, unfortunately. And give, I'll give you some idea of what is the sustainable nuclear power means. Uh, Paris uh, COP21 uh, will definitely give the more pressure to reduce CO2 in the future. And power source will move toward renewables. The cost of renewable will much lower now and in the future more. So uh, I was in the Bloomberg New Energy Finance Summit uh, this week in the beginning, and the cost reduction in the renewables will give definitely the huge increase in the renewables relative to others, but still we need nuclear. And this shows IEA's estimate is in, uh, nuclear will increase its share slowly and gradually. But this means the I, it requires 23 gigawatts 
That means big 23 nuclear reactors every year from now to 2050. And this is a huge investment and almost impossible job, intuitively speaking. But historically, it was possible because sometime in 1970s, we built more than 25 or th even 30 reactors a year. But Three Mile Island ac accident happened, Chernobyl ha happened, and it again came back in a developing country like China, but now Fukushima happens. So this is a really challenge to use the uh, nuclear power in any country in the world. Nuclear capacity must increase, but China is certainly using, probably will use the substantial part of its uh, increase. This is the Japanese portfolio, which IA says. The nuclear has stopped, may restart, and will share about 20 some percent. The current situation in Japan, you may have heard about that. Some of the reactors restarted out of 50. Two reactors are running. The third and fourth were supposed to start, but a local court uh, issued an injunction this, of the operation of the reactor. So unfortunately, only two reactors running. The public uh, antagonism for the restarting is so severe that uh, it is very, very difficult to go back to, to have the 20% share in the future, I guess. So how could we make the case for a Japanese public is what I'm going to tell you now. Uh, safety is the issue. So the safety must be uh, clearly uh, achieved by because the Fukushima accident was caused by human error. This chart shows clearly what does this mean. This is IAEA's report. And there are several other reactor sites which were hit by tsunami at the same time as Fukushima Daiichi. Onagawa, it's much closer to the epicenter and the tsunami was much higher. But Onagawa plant was saved because they built the plant 10 meters higher than originally planned. So the nature, the safety nature of the company, Tohoku Electric, uh, saved the plant. And even it was a place where the uh, people around this area took shelter uh, when the tsunami hit. Fukushima Daini, this is 10 kilometers south of Fukushima Daiichi, didn't uh, have a problem because of the uh, uh, the leader's judgment as well as new plant, so the uh, emergency uh, uh, generator was in-house. Tokai Daini, a little south in Ibarangi prefecture, uh, avoided the catastrophe by making the fence higher and the uh, action of some kind of, uh, let's say, uh, mending this high wall was completed just two days before the earthquake. So if you do uh, the necessary things, it can be avoided. Unfortunate, but uh, this is, was definitely the human error. Nuclear power, uh, I mean, IEA says that there are very many issues of nuclear other than safety to recover the public confidence. One is this, what retirement of the nuclear power plant, uh, decommissioning. About 40% of the plant must be decommissioned very soon. And then not only decommissioning, how can it be replaced? Replaced by what? This kind of answer question hasn't been addressed yet clearly. Also spent fuel, it expands almost double into the future. How can we solve this uh, spent fuel or high level waste problem is certainly the key issue to make the public accepting the nuclear option in the future. My answer is that we should not stay in a generation three or three plus, but rather going to the generation four as quick as possible. Pandora's promise directed by Robert Stone shows one of the option, IFR, integral fast reactor. And this passive safetyness was proven by its experiment 1986. 
This is uh, the uh, kind of picture design of the reactor system, which was developed by Algon National Laboratory in some time ago. And it offers a uh, very safety, passive safety future, and long-term waste management is, and also proliferation resistance. So certainly this is probably the way we have to use in the future. And this has a, another substantial merit for Japan. That is what I mean is the to solve the spent fuel debris of the Fukushima. Fukushima debris, which is a meltdown debris of the <laughs> fuel, stay there, and we are trying to get it out of the plant site, but it cannot be transported out of the prefecture. It should be solved there, but there is, there is no technology. But this is a technology probably which we can solve, the, the re, uh, reduce the level of high level, uh, high, high level radioactive uh, toxicity to the level of manageable. 300 years, the toxicity will decline to the natural uranium, while if we keep it as such, we need 100,000 years of solid place in the Fukushima. And it is probably very difficult. So US-Japan uh, collaboration in Fukushima will probably give the evidence uh, of, of, of this technology is possible. The Sasakawa Peace Foundation asked me to do the feasibility study with the experts of the nuclear power, how much money we need to build this plant, and how much year, how many years we need to complete this cleanup. Um, the result will come very soon, and uh, in the autumn, we are thinking of doing some kind of uh, exercise of explaining this option to the public. Um, this gives some way of uh, uh, supplementing the current uh, Japanese nuclear fuel cycle. I don't get into the details. It is the uh, way of uh, decentralized system of the nuclear power. The power plant and uh, disposal site may stay together, which is a Finnish ca Finland's case. And uh, this is a very interesting option for the fuel cycle technologies. American success is from submarine. But change from the um, light water reactor paradigm is so difficult that fast reactor is still under the research stage. We need some kind of, uh, uh, let's say, acceptance by the Fukushima people. This message, unfortunately, is only uh, written in Japanese. This is a message I, wa I received from one lady, beautiful lady, about how, f how she felt about my speech like this in some place in Japan. She said, Fukushima the beautiful, but now Fukushima must be utilized for the new technology like this to recover the confidence they lost after the accident. I am very impressed with her, so I use this message as a kind of a sample and Fukushima that this technology must be tested there. Finally, um, uh, this is uh, what that this is the uh, reason why Sasakawa Peace Foundation is uh, 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 engaging this kind of ac activity because uh, this uh, uh, Takashi Nagai uh, was uh, influenced by the atomic bomb uh, in Nagasaki, but even after this tragedy, he said that we should utilize the principle of the atomic bomb. Go, uh, go forward in the research, will contribute to the uh, global the civilization, and this is a way the devil will then be transformed to fortune. And if new and fortunate world can be made through this technology, the souls of so many victims will rest in peace. So the peaceful use of the nuclear, that is what the uh, Sasakawa Peace Foundation is trying to achieve. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much for that uh, presentation, uh, Mr. Tanaka. And, and again, for those who are watching online and listening to the podcast, my name is Richard Nephew. I'm here with Nabua Tanaka, non-resident uh, fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy, and Chris Kadomsky, Director of Nuclear Research at Bloomberg New Energy Finance. We're discussing Japan's nuclear outlook, and we'll have a conversation amongst the panelists for a few moments, and then we'll open up uh, for questions from the audience as well as from uh, folks who may be uh, watching us online. So if I'm checking my phone, I'm, I'm looking for people tweeting us questions uh, that, that we can uh, talk about here. Uh, Chris, let's start with you. Nubua put out a lot of information about uh, global energy markets, Japan's potential nuclear future, in particular the possibility that technology will help solve uh, some of the problems that have bedeviled nuclear technology for a long time and the use of nuclear in, in the energy mix. The big problem with nuclear, in my opinion, has always been that the financial costs of using nuclear energy um, have, have really outstripped the benefits that have been uh, delivered from it. And, and really, to me, it comes down to a question of, of whether or not the, the price of, of nuclear energy, both in terms of construction and then handling spent fuel and so forth, um, uh, can be handled. So I guess my, my question is, what, what's your take? I mean, do you think that the technological changes that, that Nabuo was talking to can help address some of those problems. Do you think that there is a, a plausible financial means to be able to deploy nuclear in a large scale? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nobu. Thank you for your enlightening presentation. So um, you raise a very, very interesting point is uh, the uh, economics of nuclear power, the primary obstacle to its continued um, expansion around the world. So uh, my theory on all of this is that to evaluate any project, not just a nuclear project, um, a natural gas or renewable project, you need to take several things in consideration. And, and nuclear, perhaps, is probably the most uh, relevant to this, this analysis strategy. We've all heard in business school the SWOT analysis, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. In the energy sector, we can evaluate potential projects through what I call the steep analysis. So the social, technological, economic, environmental, and political aspects that go ahead and drive a decision to invest in a nuclear power plant. And so um, nuclear power plants may win on environmental issues uh, because they're a non-emitting source of CO2. But in certain markets around the world, they certainly lose on economic aspects. Uh, for example, in the UK, we're considering building a uh, very expensive nuclear power plant, which would be the most expensive infrastructure project in the energy sector historically, at a cost of about uh, $8 billion a kilowatt uh, of, of capacity. Now, this contrasts significantly to what the Chinese are doing. Because they can build nuclear power plants for $2,000 uh, uh, $2, a kilowatt. So why the big difference? The you know, UK has not built any reactors in 20, 30 years. The, Jap the Chinese are involved in a rapid sort of ex expansion of their nuclear power plants. They have access to cheap labor. They have access to, to inexpensive capital costs. They build reactors in sequence, siting six of them at one particular site, so that the same people who are working on laying the concrete foundation move from one reactor to the reactor, and all six of them are on site. And um, so the combination of this provides a wide variety of, uh, of opportunities for in, in, in the marketplace, 8,000 to 2,000, and everywhere in between. So it's really become a site-specific issue, a uh, technology issue. And um, the Chinese, to be fair, are building these second-generation reactors, um, which they're starting to phase out in the wake of Fukushima. So the next generation of reactors will be building third generation generation will be set, so a little bit more expensive, around 3000 2600 to 3000 And the, the price I cited for you in the UK is a generation three plus uh, reactor, which is um, under construction um, in, in France, in Finland, and two also in, in China. So a lot of things go into the analysis of the economics uh, uh, of, of building these things. And there's also a significant lack of transparency. The industry would really, really benefit if people went ahead and, and published or, or spoke about uh, and there was a more consistent approach to sort of characterizing the costs of building nuclear power plants, something that exists in the renewable energy industry and the natural gas industry, for example. 
Oh, thanks for that. And it actually, it, it leads to really my next question because it, it, it goes to issues of, of hidden costs um, as well as the, the sense that communities have got when they look at nuclear being installed. And, you know, Nobuo, you spoke to the issues uh, uh, around uh, nuclear in Japan, which obviously are quite sensitive uh, following Fukushima. Um, it, we, you know, we're talking before the session started about even legal challenges that have been mounted where uh, individual power plants are being subject to court injunctions and being turned on and off um, uh, like a light switch, uh, you know, based on legal concerns that are being raised. So I, I guess just a fundamental question is how, how do you see public sentiment, uh, uh, you know, changing in Japan? Do you think that this drift away from nuclear because of the Syrian experience of Fukushima is really at this point unavoidable? Or do you think that, that some of the other factors in our steep analysis uh, uh, potentially will pull Japan back towards a nuclear future? Well, <laughs> thank you, Richard. Um, I think uh, the current Japanese uh, public reaction to nuclear is uh, very negative. Probably about half of the Japanese public is against. If you have any uh, public opinion polls, they are against restarting of the nuclear power plant. Um, and uh, it's because of the lack of transparency or lack of explana good explanation and uh, uh, of, of the government or politics or utilities, uh, how uh, the things could evolve if there is no uh, nuclear power plant operating. So there's a risk of the nuclear power plant, but uh, there's a risk of not operating nuclear power plant. Like, uh, as I said, if something wrong happens in the Strait of Hormuz between Iran mm. and Saudi Arabia, Japan will suffer dramatically. We depend more than 90% of our energy from Middle East, and it may stop. So the best way to protect from that kind of emergency is the nuclear power. Mm. But uh, un until the time that really this uh, oil shock happens, uh, people will not realize the cost and the pain of not having the nuclear power. So the nightmaric scenario for the uh, executive director of the IA is something wrong happens in the Strait of Hormuz. We wish it will not happen, but um, I'm explaining this kind of thing after uh, one after another in any uh, uh, meetings or seminars, uh, uh, newspaper, interviews, TV. But uh, this doesn't, didn't change, really, the public opinion. Mm. And then here comes uh, this idea of new technology, sustainable nuclear, because public will only accept it if we really prove this is passive safe. It doesn't have the risk of uh, proliferation, the weaponization. And we have the solution for the high-level waste. Mm. Until that time, and only uh, security and environmental, uh, uh, let's say, implication are not enough to really recover the public uh, trust. So I am using uh, this technology as a solution for even for Fukushima's uh, cleanup. Yeah. Maybe this adds some kind of uh, reasoning and explanation why we have and we can have the nuclear power. Uh, and uh, this is happening, and I need the concrete uh, numbers. If we use this technology, what's the cost and how many years we need to, to really clean up Fukushima's debris? So we'll see how uh, this kind of assessment will impact the, the population there. Um, some good reaction, as I mentioned, from one lady uh, it was there. So we have to clearly say what we are thinking in the mind. Just, uh, you know, it is uh, not a good idea just saying, okay, let's keep current uh, paradigm, let's keep the current ideas going. It's not really good enough to convince the Japanese public's opinion. Oh, I think that's a great point, and it actually leads to, to really a, a more fundamental question about Japan's nuclear industry. I mean, if, if Japan doesn't invest at home, to some extent, you know, Japanese nuclear technology and its, its, its ability to uh, export its technology abroad will mm -hmm. also atrophy. Mm -hmm. There's also a symbiosis here a little bit with the Middle East, you know, yeah. which is one of the, the most um, uh, likely, in my opinion, mm -hmm. potential new growth sectors for yeah. nuclear uh, sure. in the future. And I guess, Chris, I just asked, you know, two questions, you know, one, do you think that if Japan were to step away from nuclear at home, that there would be this this um, uh, 
uh, drift away from nuclear technology as, as a core industry of Japan? And, and do you also think, though, alternatively, that if Japan were to reinvest in nuclear at home, it, it has a benefit for Japanese industry in the export sector? And whether or not, in fact, there's a symbiosis, really, between Japan's Middle East oil needs and its, its ability to potentially export nuclear uh, into the region? So there's a lot of uh, um, uh, interesting points that are going on in the nuclear power industry in that we, Japan is not operating in a vacuum, um, nor is the U.S. So the U- U.S. is recognized uh, by virtue of the fact that it has 99 reactors operating in the country, the largest deployment of nuclear power, as being a leader in the operation of nuclear power plants. However, that leadership is being challenged by the Chinese, who are rapidly building um, nuclear power plants and uh, are forecast to exceed the capacity of the United States within 15 to 20 years. And so um, we in this country stand to, to watch the Chinese go from a fledgling nuclear power 10 years ago to a leading nuclear power in the United States. And part of the Chinese strategy right now is focused on developing export markets. They are spending a lot of time and resource uh, looking at opportunities, not only in the developing world, but also in the development world. Developed world. And for example, they are looking to, to finance part of the construction of the Hinkley C EPR reactor uh, in the UK. And uh, in the fine print afterwards, uh, they, they talk about introducing their Hulang-1 reactor, which is indigenous Chinese reactor design, to the UK market as the next phase of the project. This is very, very critical because if the Chinese succeed in successfully building the Hinkley C um, project in the UK or using their capital uh, to go ahead and do so, and they succeed in introducing the Hulang-1 to the UK, they will have a referenceable account in the developed world. The same strategy is being applied to Argentina, which does not have cash to go ahead and build nuclear power plants and turn to the Chinese for financing uh, uh, third generation reactors and hopefully to go ahead and also deploy a Hulong-1 reactor. So I think that being in the international marketplace is a very, very important place for the Chinese to build and they are geared up their supply chain. Uh, 70 to 80 to 90 percent of the components for nuclear power plants are now being made in China. And uh, with this excess capacity and with their export-oriented uh, uh, tr- trade policy, you know, we can see Chinese reactors being pushed along other parts of the world. Another neighbor of Japan is Korea. Korea is very, very aggressive in going ahead and um, developing export markets for its technologies. Uh, So we see uh, the perfect example where the Koreans um, successfully uh, outbid the French to build four nuclear power plants in the United Arab Emirates. And they're going ahead and doing so with the first reactor coming online, uh, possibly in 2017, and then a reactor following each year into 2020. And so one of the reasons why the Koreans were selected for that particular project is because they have successfully demonstrated the ability to build large complex projects in, um, in difficult international environments, something the French were unable to go ahead and demonstrate, and the French were struggling building their own reactor in Flamanville uh, on the French uh, coast. So if the Japanese decide that they're not interested in in aggressively developing new technology and pursuing export markets, there are other players to go ahead and fill that vacuum, noticeably the Koreans the, um, and the Chinese. And the Russians are also very active players. And you mentioned the Middle East. The, um, the Russians have penciled, uh, and I use that term emphatically, penciled agreements to go ahead and build nuclear power plants in Egypt. Um, in Jordan um, and um, other parts of the world, Bangladesh, for example, Vietnam. These projects are not moving forward quickly. They're sort of slogging along. But nevertheless, the Russians uh, have a decent technology, uh, and so they are also possible competitors. So the market is open. So if Japan does not have a conscientious policy to develop and improve its technology domestically, it may lose opportunities in the international marketplace. 
No, I think it's a great point, and, and it leads to a, a rather obvious question, I think, but but an important one. You know, what, what's the impact on international standards of safety and security and proliferation resistance uh, by the changes to the marketplace? I mean, I think I, I take your point on on Korea and its ability to to be able to you know develop you know very advanced facilities abroad. But are are there similar questions associated with Chinese or Russian uh, nuclear projects that would be built uh, outside the world? And and are there implications for safety? security and proliferation resistance that, that we ought to think about from the international regulatory perspective. And Nabu, I'll ask you to take sure. that first, and then we'll, we'll go okay. to Chris. Yeah, that's a very relevant point. And uh, IAEA certainly has a global standard for safety and security, or safeguard to some extent. And uh, certainly the individual countries of the membership are requested to to match that level of safety as well as security. So Russia, uh, China, or Korea, Japan, or any country who are doing nuclear certainly uh, satisfy, should satisfy the level of uh, uh, the international uh, norm. Um, though the problem is that uh, the, uh, the, the uh, say, uh, the, uh, in Fukushima was that Japanese uh, old security uh, or safety standard was not really, uh, let's say, uh, fully satisfy the IAEA. That was a claim. Sometimes the IAEA did, and uh, it, 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 more uh, uh, emergency measures of the uh, disasters, and also in case of uh, the, let's say, uh, defense in uh, deep uh, approaches. Uh, there are many things Japan has improved after the Fukushima. So we claim that current standard of safety in Japan is one of the severest in the world. Uh, but that, that this kind of argument, uh, unfortunately, is not well accepted by the public. So currently, the issue is uh, this safety standard. Safety standard is more scientific and globally uh, let's say, taken uh, standard. Um, but the Japanese uh, public request the anshin. It is emotional uh, s stability or safety. And this anshin anzen, uh, it, in Japanese, it sounds very similar. So politicians always say, well, we have to have safety as well as this uh, emotional security. And the emotional security and uh, safety a totally different thing. If you increase the emotional security by severe standards of safety, the cost is, em uh, is, is enormous. Mm -hmm. So uh, I am saying that um, uh, a, a, a emotional security must be achieved by different measures than the safety standard. So by doing so, Japanese public uh, may understand much better. For example, um, uh, that prefecture of the Niigata, the governor is not trusting TEPCO, Japanese uh, uh, Tokyo Electric, uh, because they didn't uh, really live with the, uh, the necessary uh, safety standard before. But uh, for the sake of uh, uh, emotional security, or uh, he may request that the headquarters of TEPCO must locate in the power plant in Niigata. And uh, in, a, in a way, president of TEPCO is a hostage in the Niigata prefecture of operating nuclear power plant there. And this, is, this does not increase at all the safety standard, mm. but it increases the emotional security of the people. Mm. So the measures can be differentiated as such that the emotional standard, emotional security, and actual scientific standard must be uh, uh, differentiated um, uh, in the discussion. Mm. So for selling the technologies of uh, safety, uh, I think uh, China's uh, move toward UK is not bad one, because now China must uh, live with the severe standards which prevail in the United Kingdom, and that certainly impact their uh, it's an operation or a construction in China itself, right? Mm -hmm. If they mm -hmm. can live with the severe standard in UK, why not build the same thing in, in China? And that is uh, not a bad thing. Mm. But uh, uh, for, for uh, 
I think U U.S. We have Japan uh, is uh, trying to sell our technologies in developing countries, but we have to do it with United States. Uh, energy technology, especially nuclear technology, is a very sensitive technology. So we have to make it uh, proliferation resistant, safety. Uh, all these uh, things must uh, should uh, come with uh, collaboration between. U.S., Japan, and maybe Korea mm. as an alliance uh, for the future. That is uh, what uh, this technology, which I mentioned today, is a possible uh, candidate for that kind of uh, triangular uh, collaboration. And of course, you know some of the the most important nuclear uh, technology companies in the United States have got uh, either Korean or Japanese partners and and, and owners in, yeah. in in part as well. Chris, do you have any thoughts in terms about you know, the the international <coughs> regulatory environment for safety, you know, security and proliferation resistance standards? Is, is it right? Are we positioned properly for an expansion of nuclear worldwide? <clears throat> a, a colleague of mine who runs a uh, um, a company that's uh, developing a safer. Um, nuclear fuels, advanced uh, advanced uh, uh, fuel, you know, told me, he says one time, that if you want to have a uh, the safest operation in a developing market uh, for nuclear power is you directly have to involve, um, you know, U.S. companies to go ahead and do that because the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission is recognized as the gold standard regarding safety uh, um, um, as far as nuclear plant uh, operations. But I'll go back to the steep analysis for example, so if you're looking at the, as let's imagine ourselves as the energy policy team in South Africa, and you're going ahead and valuing bids for nuclear power plants. The Russians are very interested in building nuclear power plants in South Africa, as are the Chinese, and they regularly host delegations to go ahead and do that. So at the bottom line, at the end of the day, <clears throat> applying the steep analysis, you're trying to sort of weigh uh, the value of or the technological safety of the proposed reactor, and I'm not an expert on reactor safety, just know that it's a very, very important thing, and you balance that, or, or that has to play with regards to the cost of the reactor. So very often, if you are sort of in a uncertain world, everybody claims to have very, very high safety standards, the bottom line then becomes, as we've seen in the in the uh, United Arab Emirates uh, decision, that a decision was made to go for the less expensive technology choice. And that's not to say that the Koreans are not building reactors that are perfectly safe or so, but it becomes a perception of the buyer of, you know, what's going to happen. And if, uh, um, uh, there's a cheaper alternative to consider. One has to question whether or not, is, in fact, is that really as safe as the more expensive alternative that, that is out there? So it becomes a very, very complex decision-making process with many different aspects being played um, uh, in the decision role. No, I, I think that, that that is a great way of, of you know tapping off our, our part of the conversation here because it, it lays out, I think, the, the complexity that's associated with any kind of you know, nuclear energy development. I think at this point, we'll, we'll uh, take start taking questions from the audience, both the audience here uh, in this room as well as folks who are joining us online. Again, for folks who are joining us online or, or listening to the podcast later, my name is Richard Nephew, and we're discussing Japan's nuclear outlook with Nobuo Tanaka and Chris Gadomsky. Um, we've got a microphone that is uh, located in the middle of the room. If you wanted to queue up behind that microphone to ask your question, that would be great. Um, uh, and I will also be reading off a couple of questions. We've already gotten four uh, from Twitter uh, as we go along. Um, please just tell us your name, your affiliation, and your question, and then we'll, we'll farm it out amongst us. Hi, my, <clears throat> my name is Cesar Penafiel. I'm an alumni at CRC. I work at Environmental Progress. And full disclosure, I used to be Tanaka Sun's uh, research assistant here at the Center on Global Energy Policy. My question is uh, about safety. Uh, you have mentioned uh, a lot about safety. But, uh, you know, aren't we talking too much about safety? Nuclear energy is already the safest form of energy. In fact, the deaths per terawatt hour are 0 0.074. Compare that to coal, which is 5, and gas, 2.8. Um, in the last month, there have been several articles in scientific publications talking about the evacuation process of Fukushima, where Hundreds of people died because they were rushed out of the zone. They shouldn't have. Nobody died from radiation. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, in the last couple of days, uh, Dr. James Hansen just sent a, a very strong letter to uh, politicians asking them to stop this fear-mongering around Indian Point. Mm -hmm. So how much safer can we make nuclear energy before people can trust it? And shouldn't we just start talking about 
how not to panic, how in case of the worst case scenario, such as Fukushima, just shelter in place for a few hours, you know, maybe evacuate a really small area mm -hmm. and relax. Mm. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. You want to take that? <coughs> thank you, Caesar, for a good question. Um, uh, yes, it's um, the nuclear compared to the other energy sources like coal uh, or wi even wind. Uh, uh, you know, casualty by the radioactivity of the nuclear power is much much less um, than uh, relative to its uh, power generated by the, the nuclear power pl station. It is uh, true, and that coal, uh, the carbon is a serious health problem. So burning uh, coal or gas uh, and replacing nuclear will cause huge uh, health problems. Uh, that is obvious, but uh, not many people know about the consequence or impacts of that kind of, uh, uh, say, uh, pollution-related uh, issues. So we have to tell clearly um, what the impact of these uh, or comparison of the different uh, technologies uh, relative to the casualty uh, due to the generation of the uh, uh, yeah, electricity. We know that uh, uh, you know this has uh, to be done, but sometimes uh, uh, the evacuation could have been done much, much, uh, uh, let's say, bet uh, better way if it was planned previously than the uh, accident. Unfortunately, Japanese uh, so-called uh, safety uh, trap or safety myth causes uh, the, let's say, lack of uh, serious exercise of evacuation or plan. That's the reason for the deaths caused by the lack of uh, proper process of evacuation for the hospital uh, patients as well as old people. So uh, that's a lesson which we have learned uh, in Fukushima. But uh, at the same time, um, was hospitals moved out of the uh, 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 let's say proximity of the nuclear power plant? It was not the case. Did we have the? Do we have the uh, central command of emergency like F FEMA in the United States? It's a federal emergency management uh, authority, which we, I definitely Jap Japan need. But uh, after five years, this agency was not created. Are we seriously learned the lesson of Fukushima? I doubt it, unfortunately. Of course, the uh, localities uh, and, and utilities are doing a lot of increasing safety by the new regulation by the uh, regulatory commission. But uh, all these activities, unfortunately, ha as I told you, it's uh, not just safety, but emotional security prevents the acceptance of the Japanese public toward nuclear. Chris, do you want to speak to this? Uh, absolutely. I think that's a very, very important point with uh, Tanaka-san is trying to raise regarding emotional stability. Uh, I visited the um, uh, Fukushima site um, in September of 2014, uh, traveled within 10 yards of the reactor buildings or so. I was accompanied by several technical experts in the nuclear power field. Uh, I consider myself a, a market expert as opposed to a technical expert or so. But we traveled constantly with a, uh, with a um, radiation detection device in the vehicle. And one of the comments of one of the MIT scientists who accompanied us says that, you know, there was absolutely no reason, you know, to sort of evacuate such a large area, that it was an overreaction. Part of that comes from the um, inability uh, uh, of many people to understand the concept of radiation. It's odorless, uh, doesn't smell, um, you don't feel it, and so there's a mystery about radiation. Radiation is probably something that is very poorly understood by the population at large. And if you don't understand something, uh, then you tend to be much more concerned and worry about that. So I think that there are opportunities to sort of really try to address the issues about uh, about radiation threats, the danger of it, and uh, you know, if you are close to a radiation source, um, pass by it quickly. Uh, put a tremendous amount of distance between the source of radiation, and, or and go behind a concrete wall, or or whatever. I usually routinely take my students at NYU to the Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant, and we look down into the spent fuel pond. 
a pool and 15, 20 feet below the surface there are, are spent fuel uh, assemblies or so. And one of the things that really sort of strikes me is I watch the eyes of the students as opposed to watching anything else. And they are very astounded at how, you know, this is, seems to be a very well-managed um, um, a way to sort of handle the uh, legacy of, of nuclear power as opposed to belching um, CO2 into the atmosphere. But I think addressing the, the safety concerns is very, very important and it's emotional. And it also becomes part of, the, again, the, the steep analysis that we need to make uh, it, nuclear power very socially acceptable into the markets that we're going to head and look at that. And um, that's a very big challenge right now. I think it's a great point. And I had a similar experience in Idaho National Laboratory looking down into a spent fuel pond. And the, the funny thing is when I came out of that and I called my wife and I said, hey, look what I just did. Her first question was not, you know, oh, is that interesting? It was, well, we don't have kids yet. Are you sure that was a good idea? <laughs> so so I, I think it speaks to just a fundamental set of questions that people have got about nuclear that, that still have got to be addressed. Well, I te uh, tease my bosses who went to, uh, uh, to Tokyo uh, uh, and to Japan shortly after to Fukushima, and I told them that, you know, watch your extremities because they turn green first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my boss was very, very nervous as a result of my teasing to him would do that. But that's a very important thing. How many people really understand, not only in this room, but at Raj, um, the threats, the dangers that the radiation represents? Yeah. Very, very, very few. Yeah, that's a great point. Sir, go ahead. Uh, Hugh Patrick, Columbia Business School. Very glad to see you, Mr. Tanaka. Thank you very much. Um, I really wanted to ask you to uh, help us understand more what's happening to the industry itself. Mm -hmm. uh, um, there is, now there are these safety standards, and the, the how, how soon will plants be uh, uh, approved, and what's the process? There's something like 40 three plants, I guess, mm -hmm. and how many of them will be approved? How quickly will that happen on the technical side, mm -hmm. aside from uh, the issue that may be a policy sort of public reaction when they open them? And relatedly, my, it was my impression that during uh, the, uh, in, in 2011, a number of several plants were being in the process of being built. Uh, have those plants actually mm -hmm. been completed or have they ah, been stopped or uh -huh. what's, what's happening on okay. the projects that were underway uh -huh. and not completed? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bob Patrick. Uh, welcome to the, the seminar. Um, uh, uh, the current situation uh, out of 43 reactors, uh, two are running in Sendai, Kyushu, mm -hmm. um, and two were given the okay from Nuclear Regulatory Commission in Takahama, Fukui. But unfortunately, uh, injunction by the local court, it stopped. Um, the, the appeal, uh, it will go t through the legal process. So uh, the Sendai situation is, was similar. The injunction requested uh, and denied, went to the appeal court, and it's denied again. It may go to the Supreme Court, who knows. But uh, so, so the situation in Takahama, we must wait uh, the process of legal process. It may take more than half year, definitely, or maybe close to the year. So that's delays. Another uh, reactor which are uh, on the way of <coughs> approval is uh, in uh, Ikata in Shikoku. So this may uh, move uh, sooner rather than later. Um, and another, uh, let's say, uh, uh, place in Fukui, uh, uh, OE may move also. But uh, yeah. beyond that, the issue is uh, these are the old uh, pressurized water reactor, <coughs> Peter Wells. So the challenge is uh, uh, the first uh, the boiling water reactor in some of the plants like uh, Tokyo Electric's uh, uh, Niigata uh, could uh, will it will be the test how fast the regulatory commission will give the approval. Uh, it may take time. Uh, it's not easy uh, process. Um, uh, some of the uh, companies are trying to prolong, extend the life of uh, rea old reactors, and uh, this is uh, yet come. Uh, we will see. 
Um, uh, and the, the, uh, the two uh, reactor side, which is under construction uh, now, uh, continue, uh, the construction is continuing. One is in Shimane, another one is Oma in Aomori Prefecture. These two uh, uh, reactor sites are given approval <coughs> for uh, construction and it's going on. Uh, but uh, yet to see when completed and given a chance of operation. Um, and the uh, prospect of uh, or this shows that Japanese government say that in 2030, about uh, 20 to 22 percent of the energy mix, uh, a power mix, will come from uh, nuclear. But uh, this is, uh, uh, when we think about the current situation, this is very optimistic uh, estimate. Chris, did you ask? Ah, well, they, they are under construction. Uh, they are continuous, continuously under uh, the construction situation. In, that is Oma and Shimane. They are, uh, this construction is continuing. Yeah, uh, if I may add, what we're seeing here in Japan is a classic playing out of a scenario in this deep analysis where the um, Japanese government, the people of Japan, are placing uh, priorities on social and political aspects of the steep analysis as opposed to economic and environmental aspects of the steep analysis. From an environmental perspective, the increase in CO2 emissions has been dramatic uh, in, uh, in Japan. Also, the economic consequences of shutting down uh, the entire fleet has been huge, uh, and the replacement of them by burning coal and burning oil and burning natural gas. So it's a very interesting watching the, the, the changes in, in people's perceptions towards what will the future go ahead and pr pr prepare. Also, another very important aspect is how do we replace that power environment in an environmentally acceptable way. So there's a big push to go ahead and sort of develop renewables in Japan. But there are space constra uh, constraints because Japan is very densely populated. Renewables is a very diffuse technology. It takes a lot of space. Uh, offshore, there's a very, very steep uh, um, decline of, of, the, of the, the offshore um, offshore. So as a result of that, it's difficult to have flat areas in which to go ahead and deploy extensive amount of offshore wind, uh, which would address the moving the technology, uh, the electricity generation offshore as opposed to onshore. So there's a lot of very interesting challenges going, uh, going on, and it'll be fascinating to watch, you know, how it eventually plays itself out in the years ahead. Oh, thank you, Chris. And in fact, actually, you, you addressed uh, two already of the questions that I've received in from Twitter, which was uh, very efficient. Um, you know, one of the questions I received was a, a question about how the the um, uh, use of natural gas and coal actually will run the risk of increasing uh, emissions. And I think you, you, you spoke to that issue as well as some of the questions associated with renewable energy and the degree to which it can be incorporated into Japan's energy mix. I, I want to come back to that question in a moment, but go ahead and ask your question, sir, and then we'll come back to that. Yes, hi. So, uh, number one, I've known each other for hi, longer than I care to admit. But uh, just personally, <laughs> just uh, one quick comment and then a question. The comment is, um, I find your presentation very uh, persuasive because unlike some uh, people, you don't paint an overly rosy scenario. You're very candid uh -huh. about the problems and you have various ideas of possible solutions. I would suggest that you remove the name former METI official from your resume <laughs> because the problem is that people don't trust the messenger, they don't trust the message. Thank you. And that brings me to my question. Yes. Just because something is true doesn't mean it's persuasive, uh -huh. as you have found. Uh -huh. But I'm trying to understand exactly the mechanics of the effectiveness of the opposition to nuclear restart in Japan. Mm -hmm. That is, sure, majority of the people oppose it. Mm -hmm. However, when it comes time for them to vote, mm -hmm. all the people who are anti-nuclear, not all, but most of them voted for the LDP. True. So they were against it, but that was not their top priority issue. That's true. Um, you know, and this is across a, a number of things. The mm -hmm. LDP, clearly there, there's no longer an opposition-powered party in Japan. Yeah. So I'm not sure what the LDP itself is afraid of. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether the Nuclear Regulatory Agency is, is being very slow in order to reassure the population that mm -hmm. they're being very careful because mm -hmm. they said their job, number one, was to restore yeah. trust. Mm -hmm. And I'd get your opinion, are they the, the bottleneck? And if they are the uh, bottleneck, okay. 
if you have a trade-off between getting these restarts quicker uh -huh. or doing it in a way that gives more assurance to the population, uh -huh. which do you choose? I, I mean, that's a difficult okay. trade-off. So one is, what yeah. is the actual mm -hmm. political obstacle? Does it yeah. lie at the mm -hmm. politician level, the regulatory level? I see. Uh, because the population doesn't vote okay. that way. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Very good question, uh, uh, Richard. Um, very good answer, I hope. <laughs> 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 yeah, well. <laughs> Uh, I think the, the issue is probably not technical or regulatory, but political, because uh, public certainly support LDP, um, while uh, quite questioning about uh, the uh, uh, nuclear power. So LDP, among LDP, there are anti-nuclear people. You know that, right? The former prime minister, Koizumi, is very against. His son is more or less uh, influenced by his father. Uh, Kono Taro is very against. Um, so, the, but Abe, uh, the prime minister, I, is said to be very positive and, and uh, convinced that uh, we need nuclear power for safety, for the environment uh, reasons. Uh, but uh, his agenda is something different. Uh, Abenomics is one, uh, national security is another. So nuclear power is uh, restarting is yeah, is not really the high agenda for him. So because uh, because he knows that uh, put, putting the nuclear power thing top of the political agenda, the uh, the public reaction is very negative. So I, uh, for the sake of energy security or sustainability of Japan in the future, I think the current lack of uh, determination by the prime minister for uh, using his political capital for the nuclear power. And the situation is unfortunately uh, shaky. Yeah. I think for the sake of economy, for the sake of national security, he has to do more uh, than what uh, he's doing. Um, NLC, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is, uh, is in a way, given the total, uh, let's say, say about the restarting, and they are squeezed to, 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 to I mean, or politicized in a way that uh, they must uh, behave very cautiously, technically, legally. So unfortunately, uh, this is, a, uh, let's say, more the political leadership issue to guide the country where uh, we are uh, heading in the future of energy security, sustainability, uh, or national security in, in Asia. If we don't have nuclear power, certainly our uh, geopolitical uh, position could be very much undermined. Uh, we don't have, Japan is no intention of having a nuclear weapon as suggested by one of your candidates here. <laughs> But uh, but uh, our neighbors are not thinking like that. So that kind of concept or co I mean perception uh, of nuclear capability is probably necessary. And Iran is approaching that way. Iran may not necessarily produce nuclear weapon, but capability is what they try to achieve. And if I'm uh, by the way, I visited Iran many times these days. And uh, they, their intention is probably very similar to ours. If Iran has a capability of nuclear weapon, but not uh, having one, but treated in a global uh, geopolitical context as a major power in the Middle East, they will be very satisfied. But it is happening. After the sanction being lifted, United States and Russia are engaging Iran for the stability of Syria. And they are very happy and confident of the current direction. So that's a way to have a nuclear proliferation risk as low as possible. So you know, this is all very political, geopolitics and international, but uh, and related to each other. But I think, uh, Richard, this must be um, led and treated by the leaders, political leaders of Japan. I think we could probably have a spirited discussion in another venue about Iran and its, uh, its nuclear future. That's right, it's yeah. your subject. A little, little, little bit. Um, Chris, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to offer that. 
<laughs> well, the uh, uh, the big issue in Japan uh, that looms ahead, perhaps, is the cost of electricity to the residents of Japan. So um, right after uh, the event uh, in March 11th uh, with the earthquake, um, the price of natural gas climbed to $15 in uh, MMBTU. Um, and that provided a huge amount of uh, economic difficulty or economic challenges for, for Japan. That price has subsequently fallen uh, as, as countries around the world have geared up their LNG exports, so the LNG market now in Japan is $5. But what happens if uh, the price goes back up over there? So here again, we have the people in Japan making a choice between the economics uh, of the electricity that they buy every single day or versus the state or perceived safety of the, uh, of the reactors. So when you look at the perceived safety, it's a probability issue. What is the probability that another event will happen, OK? And so uh, that is very hard to quantify or to measure or to, to look at control. But as prices go up, uh, if there are blackouts, uh, just imagine how we would feel in a July or August day in New York City if we lost Indian Point and we didn't have any electricity and we're sweltering in our apartments. We would be very, very unhappy. So if you have those type of possibilities and you have the price rising uh, for, the, for the price of electricity, then all of a sudden people's um, minds may or may not change. So the, is it, the examination is how tolerant are the people in, uh, in Japan to rising electricity prices, and at what point will that become, that issue trump uh, the, uh, the safety issue, the probability of another event happening, and that's something that needs to be looked very carefully. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly, in Germany, the price of retail electricity has gone up very much, and so they have demonstrated tremendous tolerance for paying more for electricity um, that's generated uh, in the country, largely through increasing deployment of renewables while they're shutting down the nuclear power plants. So it's something to look to European uh, uh, our friends there to examine how, uh, what's the elasticity of, of, the, of the price of electricity and yeah. its impact on the people mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, we've got about uh, seven minutes left, so I'm going to ask this gentleman to uh, please give us your question. Then I've got a couple of additional questions that, that I'll present uh, uh, from our Twitter uh, followers as well. But go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you for your great discussion. My name is uh, Shin Matsuno, and uh, I'm working with uh, uh, IHI, Japanese Heavy Industries, and uh, actually we are one of the nuclear power plant makers uh, in Japan. So. Uh, uh, actually, in the U.S., what uh, I'm very, very uh, impressed is the, uh, uh, the uh, you know, Generation 4, uh, so new generation reactor mm -hmm. is being uh, developed not by the uh, National Research Laboratory or not by the uh, big company, but by the small uh, startup companies. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a very impressive movement, I think. Mm -hmm. And my question is, uh, uh, do you think uh, uh, such kind of uh, movement is uh, going to change something uh, in the future uh, in terms of uh, safety or regulation or business model? Mm. My concern is uh, uh, cross, uh, old uh, conventional scheme in Japan uh, based on the relationship with uh, power companies, government, and the big companies just like us uh, cannot keep up with uh, this movement. Huh, uh, th that's a great question. Thank you. So, so we'll take that question, but then, uh, and one that's related, I think, uh, uh, actually two that are related that I'll put to the panelists, and then I think we'll, we'll probably close. The, the first uh, is, is directly related to the issue of Gen 4, and it comes to us from Twitter. The question is, can Gen 4 reactors be matched with power storage to provide the load following ca uh, capacity required by renewables? And I think that the fundamental question there really is whether or not we're looking at a new energy mix, which, which relates to the, the, the first question received on Twitter, which is how will market uh, liberalization uh, in Japan affect nuclear and renewables role in the overall energy mix? And I guess this gets to a real fundamental question about mm -hmm, you sure. know both yeah. the construction of facilities, but also what does the energy mix look like uh, in Japan going forward? Nobuo, do you want to start? Yeah, well, the, uh, uh, what would happen in, in the power market reform, uh, this is a fast challenge, really, so it is very difficult to say, but uh, the government is saying that uh, we need all the possible uh, energy uh, sources in a mix, so renewables, nuclear, 
and for sale by especially by uh, gas and clean coal, uh, cleaner coal uh, 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 envisaged. But nuclear, if it is uh, uh, costly in, in initial stage, so can it uh, uh, be uh, uh, be a very good match with renewables? This is a very interesting challenge. Um, nuclear considered to be a base load uh, because initial cost is so large, the averaging out by making a base load is economic reason. It's not a technical reason. Technically, especially in a Gen 4 a reactor, a small modular reactor can change the operation utilization much more frequently than a big uh, uh, reactor. So with that, it could live with very much well with the renewable energy such as solar or wind. So the technology may help by uh, this base load issue or nuclear issue together with renewables in the in a, uh, power mix in, in, in the liberalized market. Uh, we will, uh, uh, we have to wait and see, but storage technology certainly helps. So all uh, new uh, development of the technology it must be uh, considered in the process of the uh, market reform in Japan. Mm. Chris? Uh, the energy uh, markets are in, in a tremendous period of transition, and it's a very exciting time to go ahead and, and, and be in the energy marketplace. Uh, in the United States, for example, um, in uh, deregulated markets, you know, the United States is closing down reactors. In regulated markets, we are still building react, uh, reactors. So you have this dichotomy between whether or not reactors can operate in deregulated markets effectively or not. So um, uh, it's we, if Japan moves to a few uh, complete market liberalization, that would su suggest that, uh, based on the U.S. experience, that that would not bode well necessarily for the, the additional deployment of, of, of um, or a larger deployment of nuclear power plants. Hence, Tanaka-san's I think suggestion that you know the optimism of the federal government there that we'll have 21 percent deployment of nuclear power plants in in, in Japan. Bloomberg New Energy Finance takes a more conservative view uh, of the deployment of nuclear power going forward, largely because we see opportunities for renewable energy to play a very, very active role, especially in a deregulated environment. So it's, it's a fascinating game to go ahead and watch. Gen 4 provides much greater flexibility than, um, than the existing reactor fleet <coughs> does. So. You know, we'll see how successful they are in, in, in uh, balancing the two. The important thing to remember uh, about nuclear power that um, it is a technology that is operating with very large capacity factors. 92% of the time it's operating in the U.S. compared to 30 35% for a good wind farm, 20 to 25% for a good solar plant. So it's always available. It's always there. Um, and as we have increasing deployment of renewables, that has a, an opportunity to encroach upon the time of use of the nuclear power plants because they're higher in the merit order. They're taking first because the marginal cost of generating electricity from those mm -hmm. technologies is essentially zero. It's there, take the electricity. So there's a lot of fascinating issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that uh, I heard in the room next door several months ago is Jeffrey Sachs said, listen, without nuclear power, we're not going to get to that two degree limit in, 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 in climate change, global warming. So it definitely has a role to play in what's fascinating for us is trying to understand what's the optimal, most economical and socially acceptable way for it to introduce that into the generation portfolios of the countries around the world. I just want to uh, add to that, uh, that Mr. Matsuno's question about uh, this Gen 4 small modular type, uh, will it change the business model? It, it could because uh, I think the one which I mentioned as uh, integral fast reactor generated, I mean, uh, uh, designed by GE Hitachi is called uh, PRISM, the small modular type fast reactor. There are many different um, small modular type. Um, um, molten salt type, uh, thermal type, uh, there are many different, but small modular fact, uh, produced uh, uh, in the factory, manufacturing in factory is very new uh, paradigm because uh, uh, by doing so, it, it could be much safer because uh, mass produ pro produced automobile is getting much safer. 
compared to the one by one construction in each different site in a huge operation. So the current paradigm of nuclear power is create building a huge uh, reactor and make an economy of scale of generating uh, 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 power uh, and as a base load. But this may be di different paradigm of small modular uh, advanced reactors because it's factory made, it's, it's cheaper. And if the regulatory rule will match this kind of uh, factory automated uh, produced uh, system, the cost of uh, uh, regulatory process would be much cheaper. So if that happens, uh, the, I think this uh, small modular uh, fast reactor system could together with uh, pyro processing provide the decentralized system of nuclear power rather than centralized big scale nuclear power. Because Japan cannot, may not find a place to dispose the waste as a center, central facility. While we may, we cannot really build much bigger uh, reprocessing plant nearby uh, uh, Aomori as such. We don't have a uh, workable solution for fast uh, breather reactor system. So more smaller, modular system uh, decentralized in Japan and solving the waste problem of the current light water reactor system could be the future business model of the nuclear power, depending on the cost uh, of production, regulation, and, and all other uh, elements to be considered. Well, I want to thank everybody very much for joining us, both here as well as uh, online. I think that's a great place to end uh, our, our conversation, which was which was pretty good and, and wide ranging across the, the subjects that are, are relevant to Japan's nuclear uh, future. As I mentioned, the full video of this event will be available on our website in a few days. You can also subscribe to our podcast series on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and lots of other platforms. And this is just one of a number of great events that the Center on Global Energy Policy is hosting in the coming weeks. Upcoming events include on Monday a uh, panel on energy, financial markets, and geopolitics here at the School of International and Public Affairs uh, from 6.30 to 8.30, uh, and our 2016 Columbia Global Energy Summit, which will be held on April 27th from 1 to 5.30 at the Low Memorial Library Rotunda, and uh, registration information is available on the center's website. Um, I also uh, uh, would like to note that there is a symposium um, today being uh, held by the Sustainability Management Studio Student Association here at Columbia. Um, it is actually starting in about 15 minutes uh, in uh, Casa Italiana, which is uh, just located at 1161 Amsterdam Avenue. Obviously, it's too late for folks to register, but if you run, you can probably make it before <laughs> it starts. Uh, and please let me uh, uh, you know, thank my uh, uh, you know, guests, Nabua and Chris, for joining us and ask you to join me in doing so. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.